Hi there, Simon from simonwoods.com. Uh, I have seven wines from Croatia uh, in front of me. Does Croatia feature on your wine radar? If it doesn't, well, maybe one of these will pique your appetite. Some of them are uh, in short supply. Uh, some of them are available in Marks and Spencers. We'll start with Marks and Spencers. First one I've got is Golden Valley Grasvina. Grasvina is a great variety, better known as Welsh Riesling or uh, Lasky Riesling. Uh, so Wine of Croatia 2011, expertly selected for Marks and Spencers. And it looks like, oh no, I thought it was going to be a Vina lock. It's just a regular screw cap. Uh, let's just dig in and see where we get to. The light, slightly floral edge. There's a, a, a musky herb edge. There's quite a bit of citrus. It's on that grapefruit and lemon side. Uh, so I think it's going to be fresh, young, appealing, and one of those drink before drinkers, and then as soon as the next vintage uh, arrives, move on to that. Zesty and fresh. A little bit of smokiness. Um, unoaked, and then that aromatic, um, almost spicy edge comes through on the finish. Slightly gewurzy. Um, yeah, maybe Gewurz meets Riesling. It's got uh, it's got that uh, that slightly uh, uh, funky aromatic ginger and lychee bit of um, uh, of Gewurz and some of the Riesling uh, citrus edges. Maybe not as fine a grape as either, but pretty attractive in that form. Let's try the next one. Another Marks and Spencer's one. Pilato. Uh, so Malvasia uh, is starker. Malvasia is um, uh, one of their uh, their specialities of the region. So, uh, the region, the country. Uh, and so this is from the Istrian uh, Peninsula, uh, and again, 2011 vintage. And it's not quite as sappy and the zappy and citrusy as the first one, but it, what it seems to have got is like a broader, um, broader aroma, things like peaches. So there's still a bit of floral character in there, a bit of nuttiness too. It tastes like, it, well, it smells like it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be full in alcohol. First one's 12.5%. Um, second one is 13.5%. Yeah, so it smells like it's going to be a fleshier, uh, fuller bodied, slightly nuttier, uh, maybe not as out and out uh, fresh, but uh, hopefully still satisfying. Yeah, that's got a nice bit of peachy weight to it. Uh, it reminds me of um, um, some southern French wines. So, well, maybe maybe some uh, Coderon Blanc, um, where it's got the, that it's maybe not majoring on the um, fresh sappy fruit, but has got this um, the floral edges, bit of herbiness, uh, and this peachy weight, um, but still finishing quite nice and fresh. And um, I don't know. I drink the first one at lunchtime and the second one in the evening. I like them both. Next one, more conventional, and so the first two were 2011 vintage, next three I think are 2010. So this is Katunar, uh, there's the producer, and it's Chardonnay, 2010, I think this is from Istria, but um, I'll flash it up on the, on the screen and you'll be able to find out for yourself. Can't say I see much oak there, what I do see is um, fat, ever so slight pineapple and a pineapple syrupy uh, type of um, unoaked uh, Chardonnay, um, like, a, like a Maconnet uh, mixed with a slightly old-fashioned Australian Chardonnay, but uh, no, not hampered by any oak or anything. Um, so it smells like it's going to be quite full-bodied, uh, but um, simple, maybe the wrong word, but um, juicy. Uh, I think it's going to be juicy and it's going to be on that fuller side, but um, I'm going to do that again. Bit of butterscotch, a uh, bit of honey. Um, it smells like it's unoaked. It reminds me of uh, a cross between. Yes, it's almost as if someone's got a little dabble of a golden syrup and put it into a fatter Maconnet wine. So you've got a little bit of that uh, apple crumble type of character that I associate with the Maconnet, um, and then this weightier type. Well, I don't know, ch pineapple chunk juice in there. Bit of vanilla makes me think maybe there is some oak there, maybe, but. Um, uh, strawberry Mivia Lolly. There's, um, I don't know if you last time you had a strawberry Mivia Lolly. I don't know if they even make them anymore, but that mixture of the sweet red berry, that slightly confected red berry, confected here, not a pejorative term, um, and um, then this weighty fruit, vanilla, quite a fresh finish, um, perfectly respectable, maybe a touch simple, but um, happily drink a glass or two of that. If I have anything against it, there's not much there that speaks of um, a place. It speaks of um, well-made wine, but yeah, nothing that shrieks soil. Let's see whether we have a soil shrieking in the Bolfan, that's the name of the winery, uh, Libertin. Uh, we've got, uh, I think it looks like they do two ranges. This one's called Libertin, the next uh, one, next but one is called uh, Primus. I think those are the range. And Pinot Civi, uh, which I think is Pinot Gris. Um, and uh, as 2010 vintage, give it a whirl. 
nice mix here of um, uh, uh, there's a musky pear character um, and uh, those uh, the quite fragrant peach as well uh, and uh, walnuts as well there's uh, the, the, it's it's got that some of that spicy yes yeah, spicy muskiness uh, that's not really Alsace um, in ter I mean in terms of Pinot Gris it's more and, and it's not Italian it feels uh, there's, there's a character here that uh, I wouldn't say fitted into uh, any conventional wine box but um, still smells pretty good then when you come to taste it, there's this um, smoky elderflower. Now, sometimes when I say smoky elderflower, often it's a sign of underripeness. I don't get any hints of under underripeness here. It really does seem like it's a character that those grapes pick up, almost in the way that uh, Silvana does in um, in Alsace and uh, uh, and southern Germany. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it really is. Uh, if I wanted to compare it to, to something else, maybe Sylvana's the closest thing. Uh, it's got a bit, a bit of that musky, as I say, the musky pear and peach, and um, then this nuttiness and this broad finish, uh, but not so broad that it goes wobbly. Uh, there's still something there that's holding it all together, reining it in, and saying, Bring me some sausage. Uh, I haven't got a sausage, I've got three more wines, so I better set into them. Uh, next one, Picentum. Picentum? Picentum uh, Blanc uh, to, uh, 2010. I'm not quite sure what goes into this, um, but um, it's 12.8% uh, well, alcohol, uh, and uh, I gather the winemaker's uh, French, which may be why he's put uh, Blanc on rather than, uh, I'm not sure what Croatian for white is, but uh, no doubt someone who's watching this does. Well, I stick my nose in and I get what I call the vanilla fudge oak. Um, it smells like a quite broad, rich wine, um, and um, one of those where I almost feel the way in which it's been made is speaking a bit louder than the grapes were there in the first place. So yes, there's this warmth, there's a ripeness, um, but it's slightly, uh, slightly overwhelmed at the moment by oak. It smells okay, and I, I mean, the, the, lots of people like that big fudgy oak, but um, for me, I like a little bit more freshness, but I may be wrong, let's see. Well, I mentioned um, uh, musky pear and uh, walnut on the on the previous one. I get some of those same characters here, and uh, it's and it's another broad-shouldered wine. But as with the um, uh, the Pinot Civi or Pinot Gris, um, I get uh, still some freshness in there. Doesn't feel like anything's gone over ripe. As I said, that that aroma of the oak maybe makes me think that I wish they'd backed off a little bit on that. Uh, but as a wine, um, it rem in well, probably going about, about things it reminds me of. It reminds me of um, Roussin. Um, there's this um, yeah, there's, there's this uh, maybe like a heavier Roussin. Uh, so something that's got peachy weight um, and this uh, yeah this walnuty perfume. Uh, I like it. Uh, I would have preferred it. Uh, maybe picked slightly earlier to keep a bit more freshness in there and without the oak, but um, I like it. Also feels like one of those wines that um, I'll, 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 I'm tasting it again later on this evening with uh, the group of people. So uh, it'll be interesting to, to get their feedback on it uh, and also to see what will have happened to it in the intervening ooh, three hours. Um, it may... Uh, there may be another side of it that comes out. At the moment, it feels it feels like big and confident, and um, it's I suppose it's when when it's shed its um, its first impressions. Uh, what's left? We shall see. Oh yes, we shall, uh, and we shall see whether the next wine is good. It's Bolfan Primus. I was talking about the, the Libertin before Bolfan. Uh, sorry, Bolfan uh, Primus uh, Reinsky Riesling. Uh, that's Riesling to you and me. Uh, Rhine Riesling, as, uh, as it's called. I might give my glass a little bit of rinse to uh, uh, get that uh, weight out of uh, the previous out of my glass and. Uh, uh, but this is 2009 vintage, so we've, we've had a couple of 11s, uh, three 2010s, and we've got a 2009 Riesling here. And it's definitely Riesling. It's, it's, it smells delicious, actually. Um, uh, very Alsace-like. It's got that weight, it's got the floral character, it's got the citrus, it's got that um, slightly uh, sweet and sour honeyed vanilla, if that makes sense. No, no oak at all from the vanilla, uh, no oak giving that vanilla character. Just something that's, uh, yeah, the floral characters of, of, the, uh, uh, of the grapes coming through. Uh, it smells like it's going to be quite weighty. Well, let's have a look at weight. 14%, yeah. Uh, but, um, and I'm not sure whether it's going to have a touch of sweetness or whether it's going to be bone dry. But it does smell like it's going to be a rich, broad-shouldered, confident and very tasty wine. Uh, yeah, maybe Alsace is the wrong comparison. It reminds me of um, some rather solid... Um, 
Australian Rieslings. Maybe not the style of Australian Riesling that's being made now, but um, style, maybe the style that was being made in the in the 90s. I think that there may be some fruit there that's got some botrytis in. They seem to be excluding botrytis um, and trying to make wines that are as bone dry as possible in Australia at the moment. Here, uh, I think that there is a touch of residual sugar, adding weight, adding roundness, uh, not that it seems to need it in the first place, but it's not gone over the top. And the finish you're left with is this lovely limey, poised, um, yeah, juicy, friendly, uh, and with that, that sweet and sour tension. Um, and um, great finish. A really tasty wine, I love it. There are more complex wine, complex Rieslings out there, but um, in terms of enjoyability, that, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, final one, uh, 2008, uh, from Katunar, again, we have their Chardonnay early. This is their 2008 Muscat Bijeli Momiansky, which I understand translate as White Muscat of um, Momjan, or Mom, anyway, from White Muscat from somewhere beginning with M. Well, it's very Muscaty, uh, uh, and it's on that catty end of Muscat. That, that's what makes it sound a bit horrible, but uh, Muscat... Um, all, all dry muscats, and it, it smells like it's going to be a dry muscat. I wasn't quite sure of the shape of the bottle and the half litre size. Uh, it smells like it's going to be on the dry side. Um, uh, so it's got this floral, grapey character, but then um, it's got this weird. I got two of them which have this slightly walnutty uh, character, smoky character. I get a little bit of that in there too. And then talking about the catty edge, almost like a Sauvignon Blanc uh, type of citrus edge. Um, it's got that too. It smells like it's going to be distinctive and it smells like it's going to be one of those wines that some people will love and some people will not love. Well, I find that intriguing. Um, it's This summer I've been drinking a lot of um, bottle greens. No, what is it? Um, not elderflower. It's um, ginger and uh, lemongrass cordial. Uh, and I've said elderflower there because it's got, like, it's got like, like, this ginger and lemongrass cordial and they also do an elderflower cordial. It's got almost like someone combined the two. So it's got this sort of floral edge, it's got this gingery edge with the, um, uh, with the slightly citrusy, the, the lemongrass coming through. It's got a smokiness, I was picking up smokiness as I said in uh, um, wines four and five. And um, and then the finish I'm left with uh, it is it's not it's not bone dry I'm not sure how much sugar there is there but uh, it's it's like 12 percent alcohol and there's something about the finish that, uh, that 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 makes me think that there, there there might be a bit more sugar than if I if I put my head out head on the block and said it has got this much sugar uh, oh I'll do it I, I think it's got about like 15 grams of sugar something like that. I don't know uh, I'm just guessing there. But uh, uh, the, whatever it is, the sugar is rounding it out. The muscat character comes through in this grapey richness. And um, it's a fascinating wine. And uh, I would very happily, again, drink quite a lot of that. Uh, not my favourite of this seven, though. I think the, the Riesling was, uh, was uh, for me, the star of the show. Uh, but all seven of them, I think, have got something uh, very interesting to say. So go out and get some Croatian wines and, um, and enjoy them. And I will see you soon.